If you want it, baby, I can show ya. If you want it, I can get to know ya. If you want it, baby, I can show ya. Hello everyone, Adam Hooper here from SpermDonationWorld.com and today we're going to talk about IUI and ICI. So I'm going to try and say the words because I always stuff them up. So I'm going to do it once. So here we go. Intrauterine insemination, which is IUI, and intercervical insemination, which is ICI. So basically... IUI bypasses the vaginal canal, avoiding the acidic conditions, goes straight past the cervix and straight into the uterus near the fallopian tubes for the sperm to swim up and hopefully fertilize that egg. Into cervical insemination, it bypasses the vaginal acidic conditions. It's inserted into the cervix where it comes in contact with the cervical mucus and hopefully from there swims through the cervix, the rest of the cervix, and goes into the uterus, which the cervix will act as a filter. So basically, the history of IUI, it began in the 14th century by the Arabians, and back then it was used for stallion breeding. And then many centuries had passed, and then it started to look into dog breeding. And then from then onwards, cattle, and then soon after that, humans around the 1930s 1940s it started becoming a thing that maybe humans could start using with the rise of IVF it started becoming more popular with uh, sperm donation uh, and sperm donors and up until 1997 IUI was done without washed being washed you know 1997 in Italy Milan uh, washing of sperm was created it was created uh, for the purpose of HIV positive people to be able to have a child with their partner uh, without passing it on to their partner or passing it on to the child so from there they thought wow this is a great idea you know because some people have um, cramping from the seminal fluid that goes into the uterus uh, so from mild to severe and there's even they've been saying there's cases of uterine um, the uterine wall collapsing from uh, that sort of shock so they thought this is great you know we can um, we can implement this now into modern day fertility and we can also say don't do this at home anymore so what was good before 1997 isn't good anymore so, but, you know, basically in the sperm donation world community from that point on, we saw people going rogue and doing it and reporting great success. And some of them had even used doctors that used unwashed sperm um, in after clinic hours, which um, on the webpage of uh, sperm donation world, it touches on a bit more in depth about that, but we won't go there. Uh, so basically when you go to a clinic, the clinic, why is it, you know, it's it's got very low success rates compared to at-home insemination uh, and uh, using fresh sperm. There is a lack of success compared to online and fresh sperm. So basically, why is this? Well, firstly, starting off with the amount. So a donor will go into a clinic, they will do a donation, and then they will divide that into many vials, several vials. Uh, they put it into 0.5 mil vials. Of that, half of it is anti-freezing agent, so it allows the, the, the sperm to uh, um, defrost and unfour, so you get down to 0.25 mils. So you get a minuscule amount, you know, maybe 5 million, you know, I'm talking about with my count, I've got over what one billion. So you could, you, you know, you're going down from one billion to five million. There's a big difference. So you're automatically looking at that. You're looking at the washing process. This is not just chucking your clothes in the in the washing machine and and hanging them out to dry. The process of washing sperm is really delicate. If a if a person isn't paying attention to detail, the detail or lack, you know, paying a lack of attention to detail, then they could easily kill a lot of the sperm, wipe a lot of them out. You know, there's many cases where they, they do a, a post-check of the count, wash it, and then it's really abysmal, small 
minuscule amount that survived. Uh, from But then from onwards from there, there's a freezing process as well, which then again knocks 50% out again. And the ones that do get come back alive, uh, they do drop rates of up to 20% in motility you know, movement. So you're looking at a massive compromise in the quality of sperm from these procedure, from this happening. Um, booking your appointment, you know, so basically, you know, your availability, you know, you, you've booked in for an appointment, you need to be on peak. Once you freeze sperm, you know, you read on Google that sperm can live up for five days, but once it's been frozen, once it's um, IUI, you're looking at, once it's been washed, you're looking at them living up to 12 hours, potentially 24. So you want that egg released in that time. If the egg isn't released in that time, then you've just wasted your shot. Most places only give you one insemination with IUI per month, that cycle. So if it does, if you don't get it at that time, then you ideally you're not really going to get pregnant that month. Basically, if you're using fresh sperm, you've got 24 hours up to 48 hours with AI once exposed to oxygen, air, light, and all those other little things like seismic shock and movement outside, you know. So you're looking at, you got a bigger window by, with fresh sperm. So it makes sense why, from you know, you'd be bypassing this method and going straight to IVF. You're either going to do at-home insemination or you're going to go and do IVF. There's, you know, unless you're under 27, you know, if you're in your early 20s and you want to do IUI, um, there's more chance that you're going to, you're going to have nice good uh, tubes that are clean and not, well, not clean, but easy accessible and not blocked. And, um, and you're going to have the more chance of having a fertile egg. So you've got a higher success rate then. That's only when uh, people with PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, um, with the with um, certain medications, it can actually rise to about 25%, which is uh, way more greater odds than uh, people that don't do it that way. Uh, so look, basically if you're doing IUI, you, you want to really add... Um, a lot of points in your favor you know so you keeping fit exercising but keeping it simple low impact uh, taking prenatal vitamins uh, in lead up for egg quality uh, you know just eating well good diet uh, drinking plenty of water staying hydrated and uh, you know and try and keep calm and remain stress free so can you do IUI at home? Well, yes, you can, but I don't endorse it just because basically I don't want you coming up to me and saying, hey, Adam, um, I had some adverse effect now and it's all your fault. So no, I don't, I don't endorse IUI at home, especially when the clinics and the medical professionals are saying no. But in saying that, plenty of people have gone rogue and done it. Uh, the worst I've had um, reported to me that those have done it is if they had some really discomforting pains uh, from the cramping. I don't know if that classifies as severe, but mild cramping is uh, common. Uh, a lot of people say that it's uh, tolerable uh, and it, it's something that didn't put them off from trying again that next month if they needed to. And um, <clears throat> so basically, ICI um, is using unwashed sperm and it's not putting it into the uterus. So we'll touch on that and we'll have a look a bit more on that now. Alrighty, here we go. So we're looking at a speculum inside a vagina. It's kind of blurred out so we'll keep it PG hopefully. And you can see there's a cervical entry point right here. So basically the catheter is going in. You can see that's about three to four centimeters. So ideally that's probably just gonna pass into the uterus there. That's probably the aim of this insemination of the person doing the insemination. You'll get it, in most kits, you'll get a, a speculum with an LED light, yes, allowing you to see very clearly as we can see here. And from then onwards, you have the sperm and you will inseminate really, really slowly really slowly it's not a race it's something that can take over a duration of a few minutes of releasing so you just you know you don't want to 
flood flood the area just let it let it do its thing absorb and go through so you can see a bit of blood there that is quite normal it's uh, cervical erosion you can speak to your specialist about this to ask them if you if you don't believe me uh, or want to seek more clarification this is quite normal i would not be alarmed with something like this So now you'd slowly, after about 10 minutes, you'd slowly pull it out. See how slowly it's going. You don't want to pull it out fast. You don't want to block because that can cause leakage and spillages. It's slowly out. You see it's out. A bit of cervical mucus attached to that there. And then, yeah, it's gone. That's and that, my friends, is how it's all done. So you can buy the ICI IUI kits at spermnationworld.com you can find out more information I've done a little write up about the history and the ins and outs and all the little dot forms if you need to go over and have a look at that and uh, so yeah stay tuned for more videos I hope you enjoyed it and it was a bit educational for you peace out if you